Hello and welcome. Here we are on Friday in lecture 15. So as you can see from today's uh, title slide, we'll be doing another case study. So to kind of remember what we're doing this week, we've been uh, trying to use inheritance to help us make more reusable generators, not just for people on the outside, but also to use inheritance to make our job as generator implementers uh, easier. So on Monday, we did an example of, you know, how could we keep uh, improving our design of a queue? And by the end, we had a pretty good queue. Then on Wednesday, we talked about the formal inheritance uh, things available in Scala and how we could use those to make our chisel better, including even templating by type, and we use that to revise our queue. Today, we're going to keep going with that. We're going to take a larger application of these inheritance ideas for building a network, but it's also going to serve as a case study of watching this kind of iterative, progressive development approach where we're going to uh, you know, keep trying to get something working today and then improving it rather than trying to get it perfect the first time. Okay, so, uh, you know, as you can see, we're going to have a progressive plan. Uh, in particular, today we're talking about building a network on chip. So you can imagine in some design someone's building, they someone need to connect some sort of components together, whether they be actual full-on CPUs, they could be some sort of lighter weight processing unit or some other type of data element. Either way, a kind of a common thing people may recognize a need for is a need to have a way to connect all these things together, right? And so we'd love to have some sort of generator that can do that uh, for us, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, it would be great. And so to do that for today, what we're going to do is we're going to start from our crossbar, which we made uh, a week ago. That's not a bad start. And we're going to go ahead and keep improving that and make that uh, more useful. So uh, let's, can, let's go right into it. So let's go ahead and uh, load up our libraries. Great. So as I said, we're building a on-chip network uh, generator today and the goal is to kind of show the progressive improvement as well as, you know, using the inheritance and stuff. Um, uh, building a full network on-chip generator is actually a more involved thing that I can do in, you know, an hour. So today I'm gonna to kind of gloss over some details. So there's gonna be some spots where uh, if you look closely, maybe you see something's missing or maybe it's an oversimplification. Uh, there's some places where I very explicitly label like it's definitely missing stuff. So we're, we're trying to focus on the big picture here rather than the exact details. But not to worry, uh, building a network on chip is, I think, still a reasonable thing. Uh, that may be something you want to consider, for example, for your uh, personal project, which we'll be talking, or sorry, you have to say your, not personal, two, for, two people for your project for this course, which I'll give more details on Monday. We won't have any deadlines for that for another few weeks, but just kind of suggesting kind of ways to think of what might be uh, an exciting parameterized generator you could make. And that might be a good example. Um, so as I said, today's thing is just to kind of get the spirit of what we're trying to do. Uh, if you look at the real network on chip generators, a lot of things that it has to handle. You know, number one, these will let move messages around correctly. Today's is incorrect. You know, if there's more than a few messages in flight, it's probably gonna do the wrong thing. You need to be able to test it for development and for releasing. Uh, and of course, when you actually get into details of building a network, there's all sorts of things you need to worry about, such as, um, can you provide the right kind of back pressure and flow control when things get congested? What happens if your uh, physical constraints for how many wires you can build for a network link is less than the message size? You have to send a message over multiple uh, cycles or multiple beats, so to speak. How do you handle that kind of stuff? Uh, believe it or not, with some of these networking topologies, if you're not careful of how you send messages around, your network can deadlock, as in uh, nobody can go forward and no messages are getting through. It's, you obviously want to avoid that. Uh, as well as quality of service, right? Maybe it's possible that, you know, due to no fault of a user of this network, you know, one port, you know, is always picked over, right? How do you kind of handle that? So there's a lot of stuff to um, get this uh, better, but so today we're just kind of focusing on the big picture. What's kind of the, the main spirit of what we're doing? Okay, so uh, this is the lecture, uh, our crossbar from before. So if you remember what we did is we first defined, you know, a uh, message type, uh, we said, hey, we're going to take messages that are some number of bits, and then we're going to go ahead and have an address, and while well, we're going to be a little clever, we're going to use just enough bits to differentiate all of our endpoints, right? So how many endpoints we have, we can address them with binary, and we can use that many bits. Okay. And here's our clone type boilerplate, and we have our I.O. for our crossbar. Uh, you know, we have a decoupled coming in, and it's a vec for number of input ports and a vec for number of output ports. Okay, so that's a, that was our crossbar from before. Uh, and then the actual crossbar itself, uh, if you remember, we actually did a few different um, versions of it, and then we came back and revised it after we learned about functional programming. And even then, I kind of showed you multiple flavors of how far you take the functional programming uh, techniques. 
And I kind of, you know, applied a little bit of a personal preference and argued that, you know, perhaps in this particular case, you know, there's some electric programming was beneficial, but trying to do everything functionally, moving every last for loop uh, actually made it arguably, in my opinion, kind of unreadable. So this is kind of that mix, but I think this is kind of a good hybrid. Uh, you know, kind of mind ourselves inside this crossbar, right? You know, we have the I.O. we just declared a second ago. And really what you have is an arbiter per output port, right? And hey, here we already have some amount of fairness for a round robin arbiter. And then, you know, what do we do? Well, we need to connect up uh, for every input port. We need to connect it to that input ports to possibly every other uh, request for all the arbiters, right? So we do that, right? And then uh, we also need to uh, um, then also see, uh, sorry, see if it's getting anything ready back response. And of course, we have the output ports to connect the arbiters as well as is it actually making a request, right? Is it actually um, uh, communicating with that one? You can kind of see it's all connected here. So we did this before, uh, it worked. Uh, today, this is we're kind of focusing on the picture. We're not going to run any tests, but I am going to. Uh, you know, compile uh, these cells to kind of prove I didn't make any type mistakes. Uh, okay, so that's a crossbar from before. And already you might be seeing opportunities to kind of clean things up. You're saying, wait a second, you know, what if I don't want to send a uint? We're going to handle that. We're going to template that. Or what about all these parameters? You know, maybe these are way we cleaned up a case class. Yes, we can. So let's go ahead and do some of those things. So first, let's go ahead and use some case classes for parameters. So we can go ahead perhaps and maybe make our own parameters class. You know, we can just have a number of hosts, say a payload size, and then you know what? Maybe we'll even do this um, cleverest about figuring out how many address bits. We'll put that into the case class. We'll kind of encapsulate that uh, expertise. So then we can go ahead and redefine our, you know, message type and our port type uh, accordingly, taking advantage of these parameters now. Um, we have, you know, our same, you know, uh, kind of clone tape, uh, sorry, clone type boilerplates. So we've done that. Okay, we just made it a little bit tidier rather having as long as the things. We have these parameters. It's kind of helpful when we call things later on. Uh, we also kind of, you know, embed some intelligence into the parameters, you know, encapsulate that rather than having to put it, you know, inside of certain other places, right? So that's kind of nice. Getting a little bit, you know, tidier things. Okay. And then for the crossbar itself, once again, we can make it take those parameters and, you know, um, uh, it kind of all comes together, right? So there we go. Um, great. This one actually, I think, oops, I have a bleed forward here of an abstraction. I'll come back to what port IO is in a second, but for now, maybe we could, uh, actually I could probably can just steal this from the prior slide and nobody would, uh, it would work just fine. So if I go back to what was our IO before, we said it was across by our IO. So we can copy that, okay. And then uh, we redefine our IO to take a param. So we can go ahead and swap this in right now. Uh, and that way, this thing, the blood forward can be overridden. They don't have to worry about uh, violating those abstractions, right? So we're going to say, hey, we're going to take this, but now we're not taking that. We're taking just the params. Oops. Did I forget? Oh, it was port IO. Okay, never mind. I sorry. I already. I also refactored the ports. I apologize for forgetting uh, my order of operations here. So I decided, you know what? Um, having a notion of a port is kind of nice because. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let me redo this section. One of the things I did when I refactored the case class here is I decided having an arbitrary number of input and output ports was a flexibility we didn't need anymore. Uh, and so to take advantage of that kind of symmetry. Rather than having num ins, num outs, we have uh, num hosts. Uh, and so now we're assuming all ports are bidirectional. So what do we do? We defined uh, just a port is, you know, it had decoupled in each direction. So apologies for forgetting my own lecture slides. <laughs> but as you can see, what we did is we, okay, we decided we're now that all these ports are all now bidirectional. They have a decouple coming in, decouple going out, uh, and they take the params. Oops. And then, uh, you know, of course, we can now declare a vector of these ports. And we can use that to kind of fill it in. Okay. And then, uh, you know, if you go study inside this code inside of here, you can make sure that I connect up these ports accordingly. Notice now, for example, I have to, you know, reference into the ports uh, to get the right field, for example. So it's ports, you know, addressed and then dot in. But big picture, we're kind of just tightening things up a little bit, making it a little bit neater, kind of trying to identify some abstractions. 
Cool. I'm going to pause for any questions so far before I go on. Great. Okay. So we did one thing. We used parameters to kind of type those, par uh, those uh, parameters coming in. So our case class to type the parameters. Second, we now also can template the types, right? So um, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to say, like our other things, this is a common, common pattern. We're honestly fine with anything that's dot data. Now, sometimes you may want something that's more specific because you want to do map on or something. That's fine. But in this case, anything that's dot data, we're happy with. So we'll, we'll, we'll let ourselves do that. Uh, and yeah, well, we need same thing as before. Yeah, we want number of hosts. Now we also need to track um, the payload as a type. Remember, it's kind of this weird uh, artifact of the way we do uh, types in an embedded DSL where we kind of need this generator to kind of hang on to the type we want to do. So you can see, for example, later on, when we actually want to uh, uh, you know, use the type, it's not p.t, it's actually p. You know, this thing, which is of that uh, type. It's kind of getting like a handle of that type in a way. Um, but okay, cool. And then, you know, uh, what about the port IO, that single port we were talking about? Well, uh, that port is really just, uh, you know, yes, it's templated, uh, but, you know, you can see it's actually what's happening. It's instantiating messages, and these messages are, uh, you know, typed by T automatically for us. Um, cool. So you can see here I didn't bother to write the T in there, but I could totally just as well have said that was T. That's just fine. Um, maybe I'll leave it off because it's a little more concise. But yeah, so cool. We've templated the bundles right there. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And you can see here now we've uh, templated the actual data, right? And it, you know, deep inside, you know, we've just really parameterized the, um, the uh, internals, right? If you go back a few slides, remind ourselves of our type hierarchy, right? So uh, for each port, there's a data, which is a payload type. But from the point of view of the uh, decoupled interface, which remember is ready, valid, and bits, uh, the bits portion encompasses both data and adder, right? So uh, those things inside of here, I mean, like I said, that, that, that change other than templating here and templating here, uh, it wasn't so bad, right? We were able to kind of make that uh, change. So we're kind of able to kind of make that a little more flexible. And you know, now it's, it's pretty cool, right? We have a crossbar that can, you know, as you can see here, we can put in uh, a, um, a type, direct click down and get the behavior you want. So here we want a four part crossbar that has, uh, you know, a UN64W for its uh, payload. And because there's four hosts, you can take the log two of that and determine you need two bits for your address fields. You can do all that for us automatically. That's kind of pretty spiffy. Um, Cool. So uh, we can kind of go from there. Let's see what else we can do. Um, actually, I'll pause for any questions so far and kind of on uh, what we've done with the uh, tidying up our crossbar from before. Okay, cool. Well, let's, let's, let's kind of uh, advance. So um, crossbars are great. And if you study uh, network design, you'll find, you know, for a couple of hosts, that's the best you can hope for, right? That, that's great, right? Full connectivity, one hop to get to where you need to go. That's wonderful. But the question is, how big can you make the crossbar, right? You know, two, three hosts, no problem. Eight hosts, maybe that's starting to get a little tough. Uh, you know, 500 hosts, no, right? That's not gonna be possible, right? Because remember we saw from before, it was kind of like the all tall internal connectivity. It's going to grow quadratically internally. That's not going to be okay. So at some point, we have to not do, uh, we can't do a crossbar anymore. We need to do what's called a multi-hop network, right? Where we go to a router, another router. The reason why this works is that each router has, you know, a fewer number of endpoints. So uh, this now brings a need for a multi-hop network, right? And thus, you know, what happens is, you know, you put your message you want to send into the network, and then it goes over a few hops to get to where it goes, right? This is, of course, what we do all the time naturally with, you know, large scale networks. We don't even think about the fact that it's unique. This multi-hop is kind of a given that, you know, that's different places. Even in this case, where it's all in the same chip. We need to go multiple hops. And so what does that mean? Well, each hop is a router and that router has to look at the message, look at where it's going and then decide which is the next uh, port to send it to, right? So that's the routing process, looking at the message and looking at the address, the station address and deciding to send out the right port. Um, so in a progressive, uh, the speed of a progressive development, 
we're gonna start with a really simple uh, multi-hop network. This one's called a ring, right? So as the name implies, you can see the, the routers are uh, you know, in a ring fashion here. So uh, they have an in incoming port, an outgoing port, and that's it, right? So it's literally just what they're providing to the outside world, you know, so some hosts attach to this port. And then, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, can send things on. So what's the routing process here? The routing process here is really simple. Look at destination and address. If it's me, send it out here. It's recent destination. If not, just send it forward, right? So traffic always moves around this way. And, you know, when it reaches destination, it just comes off, right? So super, super simple protocol on routing plan. Um, and what we're gonna do first is we're just gonna implement this class however we can. Then we're sort of taking a step back and trying to recognize, oh wait, where are the kind of the common abstractions? And we can identify a way to kind of build things together to make this, um, you know, uh, not only re reuse, uh, reduce uh, redundancy, kind of have more reuse, but also just recognizing where to kind of keep patterns kind of using construct things. Uh, is there a question? Sorry, is there a question? Someone turn the microphone on. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so we can go forward then. Um, great. Uh, okay, so no questions. Uh, we'll, we'll keep going. So like I said, we're gonna try and build this ring. Right now, it's really simple. We're just going to, if I'm there yet, take it off the network. Otherwise, send it on to the next router. So how would we uh, implement that? Well, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna implement a ring router and to save ourselves a lot of slides, we made it templated, but you know, perhaps on your first pass, we won't make it templated by type. Um, and because we're being so lazy, uh, we are using the crossbar parameters rather than find our own parameters. We'll clean it up in just a moment. And so what are we doing? Well, we have our incoming decoupled port, our outgoing decoupled port, and then we have our connection to the host. So that's what's inside one of these routers from the prior slide. And then the ring network, of course, is going to instantiate uh, the right number of routers, like down here, right? So here we're doing that tabulate, and then it's gonna go ahead and connect those together. So we can go ahead and kind of work through all this code. So I said within the router, as I said repeatedly before, this is not a fully functional code base, it's just kind of giving you the spirit, right? You know, uh, there's a arrived, I say for me, kind of as a way to say the derived destination, in other words, hey, does the incoming address equal to address of this router? So wait a second, yes, there's a, parameter here for the router. And you can see that each router instance is given a different value for this, right? That kind of makes sense where, you know, it needs to know it's connected to port zero. It needs to know it's connected to port one. It needs to know it's connected to port two, or I should say host two or host three, et cetera. And so it needs to kind of know what port it represents. And so that's what that ID is for. And we can kind of check for it. And you know what? There may be garbage data flowing networks. We also want to make sure that of course that thing coming in is valid. Uh, and then of course you can kind of see some other stuff in here, for example, you know, Hey, you know, if kind of think of if these things are ready. Um, and for example, you know, when we tell the host there's, so we always have the host connected to the bits coming out of that thing. Um, but we don't tell the host it's valid unless it's, we think it's actually for me, for example, right? Um, and then, you know, what about forwarding on? Uh, well, if it's a valid uh, thing coming in uh, from someone else and it's not for me, I forward it on to the next person. Uh, or if it's coming in from a host port, we also send it out our output port. Okay, and you can see where the bits for output come from. Well, either it comes from our host port, if that's happening, we're taking it from there, if it's coming from the host, otherwise we're assuming it's coming from the input port straight across, right? So as a reminder, right, you can have this path where either it's going straight through because it's not for me, it's going on to the next router, or it's coming down to me. If I'm injecting traffic in, then it's gonna go out this output, right? That's kind of the, the flow of paths here. Um, so cool, and then uh, this is kind of a nice handy place to kind of use some things we learned, right? We learned how to, you know, the seek.tablet is kind of a nice little shorthand. We could have done, for example, maybe like uh, made a bunch of routers and had to like, you know, uh, made a range because we want the numbers to know to give each router a number, but that tablet is kind of almost like a nice uh, handy feature on seek, right? Rather than to do like a range and then for each, we can kind of just uh, unmap it. We can just pass it right in there right away. Um, so cool, we have, you know, num hosts and everyone we can kind of create each router with the right parameters as well as that unique ID. And then for connecting them together in that ring fashion, we could do that with a for loop or here I did it kind of nicely with a little bit of functional programming, which we now can remember. We're doing fold left, right? So we're basically gonna just go through 
and we're gonna save in our accumulation the last router we connected. And all we're gonna do is connect the, uh, the last router to the uh, next router, right? And then because we need to kind of have that thing we're passing on our accumulation for that fold left, we also have, you know, the semicolon what thing we're passing on. Um, and so remember, like I said, the, the pattern for signature for fold left is, you know, the thing that's accumulated so far and then the thing from this particular instance, right? And so we want this particular instance to be the thing we've accumulated so far for the next, uh, in, in, uh, you know, uh, execution of this anonymous function, right? And like I said, so we start, so this is the start of course because it's fold left, so we'll start on, you know, seek uh, zero, you know, element zero. And we want that to get the wraparound behavior from our, you know, topology. So that's going to be connected, of course, to the last item. There's a nice shorthand in the seek to say, hey, I want the last one. Cool. So that's kind of that nice uh, ring connection around the routing paths. And then talking to the outside world, uh, I just zip together the routers with the I.O. ports. And for every one, I'm taking, you know, a router and um, uh, an outside port and connecting them together, right, with that bulk connect syntax. And then um, uh, as a quick reminder, maybe you're wondering why do I have, uh, you know, two arguments here without case and two arguments here with case. Uh, the reason why is actually before that, it's the operation we're calling. So fold left, the way it's defined, is an operation that takes two arguments. So, uh, you know, here we are giving it two arguments, it's expecting two arguments, that's great. Uh, for each, uh, actually only expects one argument, it expects just the element for that particular, uh, from that collection, right? And so, well, what's the element? The element happens to now be a tuple because we did a tuple because we did a zip, right? So we had, you know, single elements uh, in routers. We zipped those as single elements in io.ports, and now we've created a collection of tuples. And so now that we have tuples, each element now is still a single thing. It's just a tuple. And so, in order to get that, um, you know, the, the couple calls a d apply. We're kind of lining things up like this, but. Uh, in order to get these these bindings, we're using the case here. So in this case, it's actually the operation is taking one argument, and we're just binding that one argument to two fields to uh, you know uh, router and port. As we discussed previously, you could just you know bind this to like t, for example, and then we could do the t underscore one and t underscore two for the actual fields. But I think binding to names is a lot more readable. I recommend that uh, highly. Okay, so that's kind of a, a gist of the ring network so far. We'll pause there any questions uh, so far. Oh, great question. So the question is, here I use the bulk connect. Could I do a regular connect here? Uh, I think you probably can. Uh, newer versions of Chisel are getting more and more permissive with what you can do with regular connect. Um, the fact that compiled may not be a good sign. I mean, it may not be indicative of what it's actually going to work or not, because it's something that's going to be, you know, the impact that's going to be felt at runtime. Uh, stylistically, or by intent, uh, usually use bulk connect when there's not only multiple things, but also when... Um, they're perhaps in different directions, right? Uh, and so, you know, remember that our, our ports here are decoupled, right? So there's ready and valid and data going in different directions, right? And so uh, that would be, perhaps I'd argue, you know, at least stylistically, perhaps a good place to use that bull connect. Uh, in theory, the bull connect's a little bit more forgiving than the, uh, you know, classic connect. So, um, you know, bull connect sometimes will not complain about certain things not being possible to connect because they can't bind ever something like that. But I think in this case, I think this is still a, perhaps a good use of bull connect. But, uh, I suspect the single connect might work here for newer versions of Chisel. It's a good question. Uh, but like I said, comp compiling won't answer that for sure. You have to actually run it and see what happens. Cool. And second question. So the, oh, so, oh, so the question is uh, about this, this thing? Okay. Oh, so the, the question is, okay, so I connected the, um, the, the method link going back to the host directly to the bits coming in from the import. You know, what else happens? So remember, uh, maybe go back to our signatures. Uh, let's go back to slide. Um, there's separate decouples for in and out, right? 
Uh, so those separate decoupled things, um, or actually, sorry, it even has that. Uh, so so ho the, ho the host port is a bidirectional port, you know, for in both directions. These ins and outs are unidirectional, right? They're just uh, the couple going one way or going the other way. So uh, we're saying that the bits um, going to a host are always coming from, uh, oops, they're always coming from the uh, here, right? Saying the, the data coming out here is always coming from here, right? It's kind of the assumption, right? And so why does that work? Well, um, it can't come from anywhere else, right? Uh, we have a one-way uh, routing uh, algorithm, so if it's, if, you know, if it's not from me, it's from here. So for example, yes, if I want to route from here to here, I can't go back like that. I have to go hop, 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 all the way around. So we're checking it over, and having that data connected is okay, even though it perhaps you know, could be garbage data, uh, because we aren't saying it's valid, right? So the key part is, you know, once it's valid, it's valid when it's actually um, uh, for me. Well, so we only really have one port, right? So there's only one incoming port. Uh, and so the question is, it's only valid as long as the thing coming in is valid <laughs> and uh, it's for me, right? That, you know, the address it's trying to receive is sent to is this current router. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think I got to start getting at. So the question is kind of about, well, you know, how many messages does network support, or do I need registers? Yes. So, like I said, today we're kind of just giving the gist of it. So uh, almost certainly, you will need to have registers, perhaps even queues, uh, to actually buffer things on these ports, right? Because uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Where uh, right now, what's going to happen is you're going to put something on. There's combinational paths. Uh, this entire design, right? You know. It can have a conventional path going all the way around like this. That's not going to be very good for our clock period, right? That's not going to be <laughs> good for a lot of reasons. So we definitely need to have some registers into our network, and they're going to need to do things to kind of either buffer messages coming in from the hosts or even between the routers that need to be buffering. And then uh, with the buffering, then we also get the ability to actually have multiple things in flight. Right now, with no buffering, uh, essentially only one message can be sent and received at a time for the most part. Um, uh, at least well, I should say one non-overlapping uh, message can be sent, right, in terms of which routers it goes through. So this is, this, is, this is definitely very much incomplete. But the kind of spirit here is we're, you know, showing, hey, we have this simple uh, router we we're trying to do, and, you know, we have some topology. We're connecting, in this case, we have an incoming port, an outgoing port, and then, you know, a bidirectional port going to the host. That's kind of the gist of it. And then we kind of link these all together to build our uh, network. Cool. Is that kind of, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great questions. Yeah. No. Please stop me. So the whole point is to kind of have a discussion about design. Uh, you know, that rather than just having like the final polish results, I kind of want to talk about the, the process, right? You know, how do we go about kind of developing this sort of thing? Um, cool. So then, uh, as I said, we you know let's go ahead and just make that ring however we can, and then we'll worry about identifying what the overlap is or reuse between the crossbars possible, right? So, uh, you know, both of them. Think about, uh, you know, what they have. Well, yeah, we could build a library that has a crossbar or a ring, and somebody could just instantiate one or the other, and that works fine. But wouldn't it be nice if we could figure out a way to maybe make that a more unified interface if somebody could put one thing inside their code, and then perhaps on one of their parameters, choose, uh, you know, which one of those they're using, right? Because perhaps maybe, you know, for their design being smaller and the network itself being smaller, maybe they'll be happier with, uh, a crossbar, and maybe then you know as the network gets bigger, they would want to automatically switch over to the um, to the ring, for example. So, like I said, so what's kind of commonality right now we're going for? Well, for now we're going to settle for just the interface, right? We want to provide the abstraction of some sort of network that has uh, these decoupled bidirectional ports. Okay, so uh, making maybe we need to work our way backwards. So we okay, we're saying we're making a network, uh, we're making this abstract. So you're, you're going to need the uh, extend it in order to make it concrete and actually implement it. And what's it going to take? Well, it has some number of ports. 
it shows port 3 node type port IO. You know, what's port IO? Well, port IO has, you know, incoming and outgoing ports. Um, and how this all put together? Well, we actually are using a, param a, a parameters, but now we're just saying as network param. Making it more general, uh, rather than being, you know, cross port param specifically, it's just network params. But like from before, it's very similar, a number of hosts, uh, a generator for our, our payload data type. Um, so cool, this is our, uh, uh, you know, refactoring there. So let's go ahead and see how this looks when we apply this to uh, our crossbar, for example, right? So now our crossbar um, gets even simpler still, right? Uh, we extend the network, and because network is an abstract class rather than a trait, we can pass it parameters, such as uh, the parameters we were given. Uh, and so you notice, for example, I don't declare the I.O., right? Because the I.O., the interface we want to reuse, uh, was already declared, right? That was the thing we declared with our uh, shared class, right? So that interface has already been kind of done for us. The internals are you know, essentially the same. Um, you know, if we want to instantiate this, you can see, for example, we'd have to, uh, you know, instantiate this module, and then we'd also, of course, need to um, uh, now give it network params rather than crossbar params. That name changed, right? Okay, like I said, once again, iterative process, constantly revising and improving and extending. But that's kind of a sense for it. Okay, so cool. We just use inheritance now, first time for today, to um, uh, you know uh, make it a little, little nicer. Cool. Um, so let's see what else we can do. Well, now let's do the ring, right? So the ring, um, same thing. We're gonna go ahead and uh, now take in network params. The router, you know, uh, is mostly the same. We just, you know, change the name of that basically. Uh, but what the network itself, once again, just like the other one, we're extending that network abstract class, but now we're a concrete class, right? We're not abstract. And hey, we define our routers and we take them together, right? So this is a really concise um, uh, implementation, right? Now, let's maybe pause for a moment uh, about readability. This is something I kind of want to bring up. So object-oriented stuff, you get really tempted to keep bundling stuff up and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to put this inside this class and put this inside this class. And no, look, I made this code so short. Isn't that great? Isn't that really easy to understand what's going on? Um, sometimes, sometimes you have to be a little cautious of what's going on, right? So what, what's the thing to think about in the back of your mind? Well, imagine if someone just got plopped down in the middle of this code or you yourself got plopped down in the middle of this code and traffic what's going on. You see someone declaring... Uh, uh, a network, which, you know, maybe that, you know, it's a module, maybe you don't know it's a module, right? So already there's kind of some amount of what the heck is this? And for example, you, you may not even recognize this as a module, for example, because there's no IOs. You don't even see the IOs being declared, right? So of course we know that, you know, because we extended network, uh, that information was provided by the, you know, the parent class, the IOs, and also that, you know, abstract, oops, sorry, if I go back, the abstract class also uh, provided, you know, the original extension of the module. Um, so in this case, I think this is a good use of inheritance where we did kind of make things simpler, but this is something to kind of be aware of, right? Or sometimes you can definitely go too far and make things like too buried. People are like, where do things come from? This is definitely possible when you have a lot of traits and do multiple inheritance for multiple traits. Um, this is another reason why, you know, even though I kind of love having my simple plain old text editor, sometimes having a more powerful tool like an IDE, you can like hover over and see what the heck is this, and it can you know tell you immediately. Oh wait, yeah, no, it's inheriting from this class, which provides these methods. So you can go see those fields right away. And so that's for you, example for you when you're reading this code. Um, although sometimes it's easy to kind of overlook uh, an extension uh, directive. Um, when you get confused about where something's coming from, where it came from, double check that, right? <laughs> um, and so ideally, with good abstractions in your object-oriented, you know, inheritance hierarchy. Uh, this is not going to be confusing for people trying to read your code, trying to understand your code. And remember that not just other people, that could just be you some amount of time later. Um, and so like I said, in this case, it's a pretty good use of it. But like I said, sometimes you can definitely come across code where it's like super, super deep. And then they declare five uh, subclasses in order to get something you need. Sometimes with a little bit of caution or judicious is, uh, judicious is good. Cool. But okay, so we've, we've redone our, our ring network, you know. Uh, we now have just you've combined, you know, interface between uh, network, sorry, a crossbar and uh, uh, a ring network. They both 
uh, you know, are case uh, classes that you know extend this network type, right? And you know, both of them are perfectly content with network params, has all the information they need in there. And so great, we, you know, we wrote this code once, and then uh, you know we can go ahead and define our crossbar and define our ring. So already we kind of have some uh, diversity here. And as before, you know, perhaps your ring needs to be more clever about, you know, probably have, perhaps having some amount of uh, buffering inside these routers, for example. Um, cool. So, uh, questions so far? Great. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, so, uh, as you know, could be desi uh, obviously desired. Maybe you want to um, uh, send messages in either direction, right? Uh, there'll be fewer hops, right? If you have to always go all the way around, right? At worst case, you have to do like n minus one hops, right? So you'd rather you can send directions messages in both ways. There's a missing arrowhead here. Uh, sometimes arrowheads get lost in SVG. I'll have to try and fix that. Um, Okay, but so yeah, so it should be all bidirectional. So you can see you can go in either direction, whichever one is quicker. Um, and so yeah, you can imagine sending messages in both directions. Now there's definitely a question about how it might deadlock or something. Because uh, before, if it's all going the same way, you can just kind of wait your way out of things. But uh, now deadlock's a bigger problem. Once again, we're going to kind of overlook that and kind of, you know, wave a magic wand. This is not a functional network. It's just getting the idea of kind of what we're doing. This is perhaps, you know, more concrete than us just doing, you know, completely superfluous uh, things or, um, yeah, so this is kind of point today is how this network was a little bit more concrete, but not all the way, right? <laughs> okay, the second thing we're going to do, oops, the second thing we're going to do is we want to look for chances for reuse, right? So, um, you know, is there any kind of like pattern or structure to our ring network design, right? And actually, if you think about it, what is the ring router? The ring router is really just a crossbar with a little bit of extra routing logic on it, right? Basically what it's saying is, would you want to connect the ports of the router? So that's where the crossbar comes in. But then the question is, which port do you send it to? Well, that's the routing logic, right? It's going to say, okay, given, uh, you know, what router ID I am, so I know what, what external port I represent, uh, and those destination from the message, uh, you know, based on that, I need to say what port needs to go next, right? And so before we had kind of a really simple thing, which is basically, you know, am I there yet? Come off the network. If I'm not there yet, send it off to the right. That was kind of the thing when we were going only one way. Now we're going bi-directionally. It's going to be, okay, am I there yet? And then which way is closer, left or right? Because um, that can go both ways. Uh, does that once again know about that arrowhead? Cool. So let's go ahead and see what we can do. Um, so uh, what we're going to do it's going to kind of refactor things a little bit, right? We're going to go ahead and, you know, build up a crossbar. Uh, like I said, that crossbar portion we were talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, what's our I.O. going to be? Well, we're just going to say ports now, right? And we're going to use this convention that our last port is the one for the host, right? So we have zero coming in from the left, port one going out to the right, and then now port two is going to be the one that goes in and out um, to the host, and you know now it's kind of it's symmetric where they're all bidirectional to couple things, so they must be the exact same interface just three times. And so we just need a crossbar with those three ports. So it's, hey, I want you know a network of you know three ports for the crossbar. But now here's where interesting wrinkle comes in, and this is why it's nice we have a templated type. So uh, our network is given messages that come in, and the address field is an address of some other host on that network, right? So I can have like a you no know, 16 host network, and the address field is going to be four bits, and it's going to be somewhere in that network. Within the router, this crossbar only needs to address the ports the crossbar has. In this case, it's the three ports of the crossbar. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use a kind of a classic uh, networking uh, trick, and we're going to encapsulate, right? So we have a message coming in. Uh, like I already have a message payload coming in, and we're going to go ahead and put another header, you know, bigger message around that, to kind of put the next information on it. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to wrap that message with a little bit more information about um, where it's going, right? So before, you remember we said, oh, I had some arbitrary data type. And then, you know, our infrastructure, if we go back to our various uh, declarations, uh, you know, it did the rest of the work, right? We said, hey, I want to send messages of type, you know, payload T to this many hosts. And then 
our infrastructure did the rest of the work, right? I said, hey, okay, well, we'll define a message type, which has an address with the right number of bits to get to the um, end host. We'll define the payload and we'll go ahead and make ports for that and then define network with these kinds of ports. Um, so we had that. Uh, and now uh, what we're going to do is now our payload type isn't just the original payload type, it's actually a message. And so if you look at what's going to send this crossbar, you actually go look at those bits. It's actually a bigger message now, right? It's the original message type plus, uh, you know, an address for within that crossbar, right? So now because of a three-part crossbar, we're now going to round up, you know, to two bits for that address field. But what's going on? So you actually look what's going on there is we're sending the entire original message, which included both an address and a payload. That entire thing is being treated all at once as a payload for this message at the next level. We're kind of encapsulate that up. So that's that crossbar. And then, well, how's the routing logic done? Well, the routing logic is here we're actually writing as a chisel function, which is kind of, oh, sorry, a Scala function is kind of an easy way of doing it. So we're saying, hey, there's some, you know, address we're trying to go into. It's the actual, you know, chisel you int. And we're going to say, hey, where does it need to go next? So uh, there's a little bit of math here in the sense of trying to figure out, okay, well, I'm going to put the one that's shorter. So how do I do that? Well, I'm trying to figure out how many hops it is to get there in either direction, right? So uh, if I say towards zero, that's kind of towards the left. So if the address of this router is bigger than the address is going, then it's pretty simple, right? So if I go back, you know, if I'm, if I'm here and I'm trying to get here, you know, if n minus one is greater than one, uh, not too hard for how many hops it is. That's simply just the gap in these two indices, how many hops it's going to be. Now, if this is not true, if I go back, let's say I'm like on this one and I want to go left to get here, what do I need to do? I need to add my index plus how many indices is this from the end, right? So that's what that uh, code is. Um, this is my index plus, I mean, this is man, right? So that's, that's going to the left. And going to the right is the opposite logic where we kind of do a similar kind of uh, interplay here. Um, cool. Uh, so uh, you kind of see that play out. And so what do I do? Well, I say, hey, you know, uh, what's the next top? Well, if it's reached its destination, go out port two, i.e. the port for where I am. Uh, otherwise, we're going to send it on to this next hop, and you know, whichever one is shorter, right? If it's less hops to go to the left, we're going to go to the left. If it's um, if this is not true, meaning it's greater or equal to going to the right, let's just go to the right. Cool. So, okay, so we have a little bit of routing logic in this next hop. Maybe we'll go ahead and even label that so we don't forget. That's what it kind of represents. Uh, and then, uh, what are we doing? Well, as I said, we kind of have this weird encapsulation thing where we're kind of... Um, putting another address on there. So to do that, what we're doing is we're going to map our things. So we have original ports coming into our module and we're going to go ahead and we're going to map them to something else. So we're mapping to, well, here we actually have a multi-line body. That's totally fine for a map. I could have pulled this into a separate def, maybe because I was trying to fit this on the slide, I didn't, but uh, what do we do? Well, we're making uh, a new thing. In this case, we're trying to do an instance of the port IO not of the original port IO for this ring router, but the port IO for this crossbar, right? So which parameters I give this port IO matters, right? So the port IO for the external interface is based on, you know, the original network params. For this internal crossbar, we have now this, you know, this bigger, deeper thing. We're using the crossbar params uh, for that port IO. And then what we do, we connect things up, right? So we're saying, hey, the, what address is this uh, port going to? it's going to go to the next top, right? So here you're applying that routing logic. Well, in this case, it's all combinational, so no state. Totally fine to just kind of do that. So we're saying, hey, you know, for this incoming port, we're going to go ahead and remap it to this next thing. It's going to figure out, okay, well, I do need to go to port 0, 1, or 2 in order to keep the thing moving along. Um, you can imagine what's the kind of corner case you got to be careful about. You know, what if someone's trying to send a system themselves? Once again, these corner cases may not work. This may not be a well-tested network. But that kind of plays out. And, of course, what's the payload? Well, the payload is uh, of this new thing is the entire original dot bits. So remember the dot bits includes a dot data and a dot adder. And so the original entire message is now the, just the payload of this new kind of crossbar. Um, and, uh, you know, likewise, what's coming out the other end um, is, you know, coming from that there. Okay, and so then we go ahead and, and save the name of this new... Uh, We'll return it to say because it's a map. We want to get a list of these new ports routed. And then with these ports routed, we can go ahead and zip these up with the actual I.O. parts for the crossbar and then connect them. 
So now what do we have? Well, now we have a router, which instantiated the crossbar, which, uh, you know, for each of those ports coming in, I applied the, the routing logic to, you know, change to make a specific uh, destination for um, within that, you know, within the router to get the next hop. And then I connected that all up, right? All these, you know, routings, logics with the crossbar. So there's a lot going on here. So it's kind of good to kind of pause and take it over, maybe even draw some dagger to kind of see what's going on. But that's what's going on on our, on our new router. And then um, the good news is actually, is even though we did all this kind of cleverness in the, the router, it didn't change a lot in the network itself, right? We still need to instantiate, you know, and routers. We connect them all together in a ring with the fold left. Now, rather than having dot in and dot out, we have, you know, this convention of uh, kind of ports one is to the right and port zero is to the left. Okay. And then, you know, going back to the host is ports two. So, yes, there's some hard-coded magic numbers there, but that kind of gets the, um, the gist across. So, let me all pause for questions on this one. So, cool. If I didn't break anything, uh, great. Did not break anything. Uh, I keep it to revalue these cells because I keep redefining things so I don't revalue them later once I get the wrong version. Um, and speaking of wrong versions, uh, we are missing a slide declaration. So I'm going to go ahead and sneak that in real quick and jump back into presentation mode. Great. So what have we done so far? Parameterize the number of hosts? Check. Uh, parameterize data type? Check. Bidirectional. We can send messages in the, in the shorter direction? Check. You know, assuming you filled that logic incorrectly. Um, but we don't have that nice uh, interchangeability with the crossbar, right? So let's go ahead and see what we can do about that. So maybe you want to make a network factor just saying, hey, I wanted to call network and just have it give me uh, the right thing. So one way of doing that might be uh, actually doing a little bit of pattern matching based on case classes. So what I can say, for example, is maybe I'll tweak my parameters to be an abstract class. So it kind of has the same fields as before, but because they're abstract, they aren't even defined, right? There's a number of hosts, there's a, a payload, and there's, uh, you know, the address bit width, which is calculated based on the number of hosts. But remember, it doesn't even know number of hosts yet. That's an abstract class. And then go ahead and um, make case classes that extend network paramps. So case classes, remember, kind of do special things in your life. They're really nice to do a case classes for a lot of things. How are we get those niceness of case classes? There's, a, there's some consequences to case classes, right? Some costs, right? So one of the costs of a case class is you can't extend a case class. How, so, but you can extend an abstract class with a case class. That's totally fine, which is what we did here. Another thing we did here is we are, this is kind of something we, a little subtle but we're picking up on. We use these case class fields to populate these abstract fields in the original class. Now, oftentimes people would have this kind of pattern of a abstract class with case classes extending it. Usually they aren't populating fields, but in this case we are. Um, and that's totally fine. Uh, that's, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, other times we want to kind of define fields, maybe we'll mix in some traits. Also very doable. Um, so now we have uh, these two case classes, one for crossbar, one for ring. You can see they look exactly the same. They don't have anything unique to these things. We can imagine maybe if you want to build more and more specialized generators, maybe there's some parameters that are specialized to each generator. Maybe you want to take certain parameters such as, you know, um, how many internal connectivity ports I have in my crossbar to control that, right? Or maybe I'll take a parameter ring to say, is it bidirectional or not, for example? That could be a parameter, right? So you can imagine that. And we we'll go ahead and make um, a, uh, a factory, right? We have you know, our network object taking in parameters and then based on we're matching on the type of the parameter coming in, the pattern matching, we're going to create the right type of network, right? So somebody can build code and just expect a network, and then which network they get, they're going to kind of pick when they choose which parameters they pass into this function. So, you know, this is going to be someone uh, calling it, you know, as, you know, network, you know, crossbar params, for example, you know, uh, you know, dot, 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 right? Um, cool. So as you see here, I have a note for myself. I have to do next slide first. What's on the next slide? Well, I need to redefine uh, the crossbar and the ring to take these other types of parameters. So let's go see the next slide. Uh, you know, I redefined everything in terms of network, uh, network params, sure. Okay, uh, and then here's, for example, the crossbar. And if you scroll down, uh, you will also find uh, the, the uh, ring redone. But the same thing, make sure that worked. This should now compile. Great, it does. Cool. So. Um, 
now we have this network factory, right? Where depending on which case class parameters we send in, we'll get a different thing. Uh, that's kind of nifty. Uh, questions so far? Okay, I guess we can continue. Okay, so then, uh, you know, uh, you may say, well, what if I want to do more topologies, right? You know, so we did a ring. Maybe people in the file of an object network, maybe your first file is like a mesh, like a, like a 2D uh, grid of uh, connections. Um, a torus is a mesh that has links wrapping around like a ring. So a ring is kind of like a 1D torus. We have like a 2D torus, for example. Um, and so also we look for opportunities to kind of share things between these components, right? And uh, as I said before, we kind of think about a router internally, uh, sorry, a network in general first. Within a network in general, you know, we're talking about some abstractions here of, well, there's a router and how the router is connected, right? And that's kind of what's going on. So I kind of tie that up. Well, what if we just say, hey, what if I define a router and then make this an abstract class? And yeah, yeah it's going to have some reports on the router and then uh, take in the network parameters uh, and, you know, has a unique ID for this router. Then I'll go ahead, you know, here's a convention of, you know, our last port being the host. Remember, for example, for our ring, we had three ports on the router, and that third port went down to the host. Here's our crossbar. We're leaving the next top logic, the routing logic, uh, you know, abstract, because, uh, sorry, uh, you know, uh, abstract, because we didn't actually make it defined yet. But we're going to go ahead and share this connectivity stuff here. And then we also have, uh, you know, connecting uh, the uh, ports at the end. So I'm going to zoom out in case there's anything else I'm missing in this box. Yes, there is a little bit. Um, it's a little bit cramped. Uh, but you also can see, yeah, you know what? Maybe it's better. Give me a moment. I can quickly make this uh, this the new slide. That might be better. Yeah, that's better. Okay, great. So now you can see, for example, that um, so we're going to find a new type of a multi-hop network, which is a special kind of network. It's not just... So not just a module, it's a special kind of network, which specifically has a bunch of routers. And we say, hey, there's some way to connect the routers. We're leaving it abstract. So someone else needs to go ahead and over implement that with a concrete class. We, you know, given the routers, we connect the routers. <laughs> and then uh, we connect them, connect them to the outside port. So that part's shared. So now if we look at what it takes to make a ring, well, really, all we need to focus on is the part that makes the ring unique. Right, so now all we need is the next top routing logic for the ring, and we're overriding that. The rest of the stuff in the router has been pulled into this abstract class, right? And we're reusing that, so that's really nice. Um, so, and notice how, for example, when we reuse that router, we're telling it, hey, we do want three ports on that router, right? The thing about the ring, we have the two ports for the ring and then the one port for the host. So we have need those three ports. Um, cool. So that that's it, right? This is you know getting a little bit more tidy. Uh, and then for what about the, the ring itself? Well, we go ahead and make the routers concrete. In this case, we like doing, uh, you know, seek tabulate. Maybe for some other network topology, you might have some other way of populating that data structure you might like better. Um, and additionally, you know, what does our connect routers method do? Well, it has side effects. There's no return type or anything. But you know, here we're doing a fold left for the ring, which works just fine. So yeah, uh, oops, I probably should have actually evaluated the prior slide. Great, cool. So that's that's our our ring um, redone this mode. Questions on this? So as I used this to motivate a few slides ago, what about if we want to do a two D torus? So I said a ring technically is like a one D torus, but what if we want to go in two dimensions? Uh, well, we can go ahead and make our own parameters for that, right? So we can go ahead and extend network params. In this case, there actually are some more fields, right? Uh, maybe we'll ask somebody to tell us how many rows they want in the torus, and we'll go ahead and automatically divide those into an even number of columns, and we're going to require that, you know, th these are divisible, right? If you, these aren't square, we don't have to do. We're not square, but not rectangular, we, we don't have to do. So we'll say, I can't handle that. So we make that a requirement. And then for our router, okay, we're taking in our torus parameters this time. Uh, and oops, there's a bug here. It's not going to be three. It's going to be uh, five, right? Because uh, you want to have the four directions as well as going out to the host. Um, and then 
Uh, so sustain that router type, right, that class. And then, you know, so here we can fill in our routing logic, we should, uh, you know, how that's gonna be done. And then for the network itself, same kind of thing, we're gonna extend the multi-hop network. We're gonna populate our, our routers uh, as we would like, and then we're gonna go ahead and connect them in as we need to, right? And as you can imagine, there has some sort of cleverness. We either work for loops or functional programming to kind of, you know, make a grid of routers and do the appropriate things. Um, so cool. Uh, so that's an example of doing the, a torus, right? It's another thing. So here we've kind of abstracted things away where now we've really reduced the overhead of making a, a new uh, class with this. So if we keep going, um, what do we do? Well, we took, uh, and we got some useful reuse via inheritance here, right? So we not only inherited some code to make our code shorter, we also inherited some interfaces. And it allows each of our networks to kind of focus on what makes those networks um, unique, right? So uh, for example, the crossbar directly extended network because it was able to kind of just go plug a network in right away. These other networks are these multi-hop networks, which actually had to have routers and then they had that router abstraction. That was kind of mixed into this, right? And here you can even hide this behind a factory function, you know, and uh, go ahead and return this based on, maybe I'll make this uh, TP to make this consistent. Uh, go ahead and return this, make it consistent. But um, that's pretty cool. So we kind of saw a lot of things we saw in the last two weeks kind of all applied at once here, right? We saw um, using case classes for parameters kind of tidy things up. We saw better use of the functional program to kind of make things nice and neat. We saw templating types. Uh, and it wasn't just templating types for the sake of, oh, I want to do maybe not a UINT or something like that. It was actually like, we just used a bundle for Windows. It was kind of nice to get reuse of a crossbar that way. We were able to use a crossbar within the other network type. That was kind of cool. And um, we're using inheritance, right? We're able to use inheritance to define interfaces and reuse those interfaces. Uh, and we're also reusing, reusing some common abstractions, right? We had this notion of a multi-hop network, which is, you know, a sea of routers connected together and you're able to kind of reuse some of that code. So cool. Uh, questions on this? Okay, uh, cool. So then um, the last slide is really just kind of some takeaways, right? So we kind of talked about this, right? We had an example of progressive design, right? And I really recommend this kind of approach, right? We're taking these baby steps at a time, get things working and then keep improving and extending and revising, right? So uh, sometimes someone says I'm gonna build a network generator, they get really ambitious, say, okay, I need to go define, you know, a zillion abstractions and no, as you start, building it, you'll have a better notion about where you need flexibility, where you need the reuse, and where you don't need things, right? Like, if you have a bunch of abstractions that are only have one instance of, that may not be as helpful as you think, right? It might be good to have kind of a more concrete thing that's kind of a shallower hierarchy, so to speak. Um, so that's why I kind of like this approach of, you know, you get something working, and then when you have an other instance, then it's the time to look for a chance to refactor and make it reusable, right? Um, and so, yeah, so what are we using? Uh, well, one guide for, you know, a hint when you're reusing stuff is if you find yourself saying, hey, I want this code, but this small change applied to it, i.e. copy pasting code, that's a good indication that perhaps you should look for a opportunity for reuse there, right? Now, oftentimes we kind of mimic our own code in small bits here and there, but if it's a large portion, you're kind of copying and pasting. It's, like I said, it's a good sign that, well, not a good sign, but it's a sign that you are, Reuse, uh, you should, maybe you should consider some sort of way to get reused, right? Um, and we saw a way to use inheritance here, kind of, you know, the more applies with the chisel. We're going to kind of do more in Scala level. Today, it's kind of more in the chisel level. And yeah, now this templating with generics, um, you know, we have these uh, things we kind of constantly keep having. Uh, you know, T is a subtype of data. That's probably the most common one you're going to use, but you may have other types, right? Um, you can imagine, oops, if I go back a slide, uh, you know, go back a few more slides, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, maybe uh, here I chose to do inheritance overriding things. Alternatively, maybe you could have a just general network constructor, which took in as a type, the first, uh, first class, you know, high order function, the router thing and the router connecting functions. And you could do it that way, router with inheritance, right? So there's, there's some choices. Um, but kind of the picture is here, you look for reuse, look for ways to kind of have reusable, clear abstractions for both yourself and uh, for your readers and users. And um, that's it. So uh, that's the end of the lecture.
two quick announcements. Uh, if you saw on the Slack, so I have my office hours starting now, so I'll be staying on this call. Uh, and number two, um, we're gonna get the lab up uh, later today, and it'll be due later to compensate for that uh, accordingly. Um, great, uh, any other last questions before we switch over officially to office hours mode? Okay, all right, well, sure, sure, yes, go ahead. So homework five will hopefully be ready to go uh, for posting by Saturday or Sunday. Uh, there will be a homework six. Uh, homework seven, if there is one, will be lighter. So I would say definitely six homeworks total. Um, seven is a maybe uh, or maybe shorter one. No problem. Okay, so I'm gonna now stop the recording and it'll be office hours.